Lethal Gift of Livestock The Evolution of Germs Some of us adults, even more of our children, pick up infectious diseases from our pets. Usually they remain no more than a nuisance, but a few have evolved into something far more serious. The major killers of humanity throughout our recent history, smallpox, flu, tuberculosis, malaria, plague, measles, and cholera, are infectious diseases that evolved from diseases of animals, even though most of the microbes responsible for our own epidemic illnesses are paradoxically now almost confined to humans. Because diseases have been the biggest killers of people, they have also been decisive shapers of history. Until World War II, more victims of war died of war-borne microbes than of battle wounds. All those military histories glorifying great generals oversimplify the ego-deflating truth. The winners of past wars were not always the armies with the best generals and weapons, but were often merely those bearing the nastiest germs to transmit to their enemies. The grimmest examples of germs' role in history come from the European conquest of the Americas that began with Columbus's voyage of 1492. Numerous as were the Native American victims of the murderous Spanish conquistadors, they were far outnumbered by the victims of murderous Spanish microbes. Why was the exchange of nasty germs between the Americas and Europe so unequal? Why didn't Native American diseases instead decimate the Spanish invaders, spread back to Europe, and wipe out 95% of Europe's population? Similar questions arise for the decimation of many other native peoples by Eurasian germs, as well as for the decimation of would-be European conquistadors in the tropics of Africa and Asia. Thus, questions of the animal origins of human disease lie behind the broadest pattern of human history and behind some of the most important issues in human health today. Think of AIDS, an explosively spreading human disease that appears to have evolved from a virus resident in wild African monkeys. Why did the rise of agriculture launch the evolution of our crowd infectious diseases? One reason is that agriculture sustains much higher human population densities than does the hunting-gathering lifestyle, on the average 10 to 100 times higher. In addition, hunter-gatherers frequently shift camp and leave behind their own piles of feces with accumulated microbes and worm larvae. But farmers are sedentary and live amid their own sewage, thus providing microbes with a short path from one person's body into another's drinking water. Some farming populations make it even easier for their own fecal bacteria and worms to infect new victims by gathering their feces and urine and spreading them as fertilizer in the fields where people work. Irrigation agriculture and fish farming provide ideal living conditions for the snails carrying schistosomiasis and for flukes that burrow through our skin as we wade through feces-laden water. Sedentary farmers become surrounded not only by their feces, but also by disease-transmitting rodents, attracted by the farmer's stored food. The forest clearings made by African farmers also provide ideal breeding habitats for malaria-transmitting mosquitoes. If the rise of farming was thus a bonanza for our microbes, the rise of cities was a greater one, as still more densely packed human populations festered under even worse sanitation conditions. Not until the beginning of the 20th century did Europe's urban populations finally become self-sustaining. Before then, constant immigration of healthy peasants from the countryside was necessary to make up for the constant deaths of city dwellers from crowd diseases. Another bonanza was the development of world trade routes, which by Roman times effectively joined the populations of Europe, Asia, and North Africa into one giant breeding ground for microbes. That's when smallpox finally reached Rome as the plague of Antoninus, which killed millions of Roman citizens between A.D. 165 and 180. Similarly, bubonic plague first appeared in Europe as the plague of Justinian, A.D. 542-43. But plague didn't begin to hit Europe with full force as the Black Death epidemics until A.D. 1346 when a new route for overland trade with China provided rapid transit along Eurasia's east-west axis for flea-infested furs from plague-ridden areas of Central Asia to Europe. Today, our jet planes have made even the longest intercontinental flights briefer than the duration of any human infectious disease. That's how an Aerolineas Argentinas airplane, stopping in Lima, Peru in 1991, 
managed to deliver dozens of cholera-infected people that same day to my city of Los Angeles, over 3,000 miles from Lima. The explosive increase in world travel by Americans and in immigration to the United States is turning us into another melting pot, this time of microbes that we previously dismissed as just causing exotic diseases in far-off countries. Thus, when the human population became sufficiently large and concentrated, we reached the stage in our history at which we could at last evolve and sustain crowd diseases confined to our own species. But that conclusion presents a paradox. Such diseases could never have existed before then. Instead, they had to evolve as new diseases. Where did those new diseases come from? Evidence has recently been emerging from molecular studies of the disease-causing microbes themselves. For many of the microbes responsible for our unique diseases, molecular biologists can now identify the microbes' closest relatives. These also prove to be agents of crowd infectious diseases, but ones confined to various species of our domestic animals and pets. Among animals, too, epidemic diseases require large, dense populations and don't afflict just any animal. They're confined mainly to social animals providing the necessary large population. Hence, when we domesticated social animals, such as cows and pigs, they were already afflicted by epidemic diseases just waiting to be transferred to us. For example, measles virus is most closely related to the virus causing rinderpest. That nasty epidemic disease affects cattle and many wild cud-chewing mammals, but not humans. Measles, in turn, don't afflict cattle. The close similarity of the measles virus to the rinderpest virus suggests that the latter transferred from cattle to humans and then evolved into the measles virus by changing its properties to adapt to us. That transfer is not at all surprising, considering that many peasant farmers live and sleep close to cows and their feces, urine, breath, sores, and blood. Our intimacy with cattle has been going on for the 9,000 years since we domesticated them, ample time for the rinderpest virus to discover us nearby. Others of our familiar infectious diseases can similarly be traced back to diseases of our animal friends. Given our proximity to the animals we love, we must be getting constantly bombarded by their microbes. Those invaders get winnowed by natural selection, and only a few of them succeed in establishing themselves as human diseases. A quick survey of current diseases lets us trace out four stages in the evolution of a specialized human disease from an animal precursor. The first stage is illustrated by dozens of diseases that we now and then pick up directly from our pets and domestic animals. They include cat scratch fever from our cats, leptospirosis from our dogs, psittacosis from our chickens and parrots, and brucellosis from our cattle. We're similarly liable to pick up diseases from wild animals, such as the tularemia that hunters can get from skinning wild rabbits. All those microbes are still at an early stage in their evolution into specialized human pathogens. They still don't get transmitted directly from one person to another, and even their transfer to us from animals remains uncommon. In the second stage, a former animal pathogen evolves to the point where it does get transmitted directly between people and causes epidemics. However, the epidemic dies out for any of several reasons, such as being cured by modern medicine or being stopped when everybody around has already been infected and either becomes immune or dies. For example, a previously unknown fever termed Onyongyong fever appeared in East Africa in 1959 and proceeded to infect several million Africans. It probably arose from a virus of monkeys and was transmitted to humans by mosquitoes. The fact that patients recovered quickly and became immune to further attack helped the new disease die out quickly. Closer to home for Americans, Fort Bragg fever was the name applied to a new leptospiral disease that broke out in the United States in the summer of 1942 and soon disappeared. 